some of the debris but uh, that widow maker is on the other side of that solid tree so that's not coming down on me but when you're out in these environments when you're in the thick bush you know they talk about widow makers above you and you got to watch out for it and everything and to the best degree I can you know I am but uh, you're also in an area where there isn't these big open spaces with just one or two trees everything's packed in this this forest is pretty uh, productive you know, uh, I believe I'm around a pine forest at this point in time. So, I'm just, uh, either way, I'll throw my backpack up on the tree and get the camp rolling. I picked this tree, for one, because it's a smaller diameter, and for two, some of the other trees around me, the sap is right on the outside edge of the bark. So if you put your bag against it, you just get sap everywhere. So I brought along a plastic container and a single walking stick for this episode. And I'll put those to use later on in the video. Like I say, just gonna hang up my bag at this point. This is a habit that I've gotten into over the years of I always like to hang my bag off a tree if at all possible. Get up out of the moisture of the ground. You know, it's have everything raised up to a height where it's easier to access and that kind of stuff. Just gotta find a stick to use. Hold on. Oh, there's tons of them around here, but. There we go. Got a loop. So, I just put a loop on the end of a 6 8 foot piece, fed the tail end through the loop after I wrapped around the tree, kind of cinches onto the tree. I'm gonna do a Marlin spike hitcher, where you just kinda loop the rope over itself reach through, pull on the main line, and then just feed a stick through. Pull tension to it and it locks that stick in place on the line now. Now as you can see my bag's now up off the dirt. It's easier to access things. I've got pockets that are right at chest height. It just, uh, I just find it a more convenient way to do things. So I'll, I'll cut to the next scenes and move, move on in the video. So for this camp setup, uh, I, I need a good uh, at least 10 foot square area that's flat. So this chunk of forest is flat enough for my purposes. But like I say, there's a lot of sticks and you know, debris on this area. So I've got to clear out this entire zone. So I've got a nice flat pad to work on. See, that's long rotten wood. So, needless to say, that'll be my main plan at this point is just to uh, get all these twigs, uh, twigs and sticks, you know, get them out of the way, clear out a zone to work in. I'll cut back when it's cleaned off. So there was nothing fancy or magical here. Just used my feet to kind of kick the debris out along the edges and created a relatively clean, it's not spotless. It's not quite level, but it's fairly close. It slopes down on that one side. And one of the, should just point this out for the bushcraft people. You know, you get the roots of these pine trees and that. They can make good lengths. If I pop that out, as you can see, I quickly and easily uh, just pull this side a bit more. All right, so I'm to a fairly strong artery there. So I'll just snip that off with a knife and I'll pull this out and show you the full length of it, of how easy it is to get, you know, cordage and then what to do with this to kind of clean it up a bit to make it more usable. So and, uh, this is a little side project in the video. I wasn't planning on it, but I'll show you this. This is, this is uh, useful to know. On the one end of the root. It just came out to an even larger root, but I, I just don't want it all. I don't need it. In fact, let me switch over to my other blade on there. 
use a serrated edge. There we go. So th this root stays thick and long and strong for a half decent length. Uh, right now, this is probably 10, 12 foot root run. You know, I've, I'll clean it up a bit and show you how to clean it up. Pretty so the first order business, you just want to kind of take all the smaller roots that are coming off and just go down the root, the main root you're working with and kind of clean those all off. I've already done the better part of it. I'm just getting to the end now. And that's still got good strength to it. So, so I've done that along the entire length just to kind of clean it up a bit. There's a few nubs here and there. They're not showstoppers, but I do try to get them off the best I can just to have it be kind of a bit cleaner on the line. So my next kind of key step is I take the root and I find a stone with a, a stone with a fairly sharp edge to it. And I'm just going to kind of rub the bark against that stone. And you'll see that the outer bark of the root starts to loosen up and come off. And then it's got a lighter colored kind of inner pith, if you will. If I wanted to make this last, I've done a little bit here. I'll just kind of connect those two. So, if I wanted this cordage to last a little longer, I do this to the entire length. And it makes it more supple. So you can tie it in knots a lot easier. But it also makes it that uh, it doesn't uh, dry up as easy and become brittle. That outer bark, if it dries and becomes hard, when you go to bend it, it'll just want to snap the entirety of it. So for longevity's sake, you would want to take that outer layer off. And, uh, you know, for the project I'll use this for, I'll just use this on a tripod. I normally use loops that I put on, uh, you know, three sticks to... I'll just do a tripod with purely primitive stuff so you can see, you know, how even if you don't have gear, the tripod becomes a useful thing. But either way, that would that's exactly what you do if you wanted it to uh, last a bit longer. I'm not worried about it in this example today. This was actually just a side project. <laughs> so now, as you can see, I'm six foot arm length in my span of my arm. So there's six. I've got close to 12 foot of cordage, if you will, right off the land, very easily obtained. So the thinking really is the thinner end of the root, because roots always have a thicker end and a thinner end, the thinner end of the root is the end that, uh, for ease of tying the knots and stuff, you definitely want to have the outer bark taken off of the root. And the larger side, you'd start with that wrapping around your object and that kind of stuff, just uh, to make sure that it was easier later for the knots. But as you can see, absolute usable piece of cordage. So I'll go find three sticks in the area that are long enough to build a tripod and I'll use this to lash that together. So as you can see, I've already got one stick. Got another one that I need to process. A lot of the sticks, even though there's tons of sticks around here, a lot of them are very uh, brittle. So you take a little bit of a larger diameter when you find that. And uh, you know, it becomes a little bit harder to find. Most of the sticks around here are less than five foot in length. So I gotta kind of wander and find my third, but this is thick enough, I'll use my little saw. Well, I'll just do it now. So just to make sure all the legs are the same length on your tripod as best you can. about there, just leave a little mark so I know where it's at. Put my foot over, kind of hook it in on the back side of my kneecap, and then hold on to this side and kind of brace everything. It allows you to have a solid way to kind of saw through the material with ease. I don't know if I can get enough length out of the next piece, we'll see. Yeah, might be alright. I know I want that one to snap off entirely, and that. It's in the back of the plumber's vice. This just ensures that the saw you're not using in around your groin area, the triangle of death they call it. You know, you want to stay away from vital arteries and that kind of stuff in here. 
try to never do any type of blade work inside that zone. If you hit a major artery, you could be dead before you even get out of the woods. Okay, so I've got my three sticks now, and I've got my piece of root. I'm just gonna, so I'm going to take the root and just root. I'm going to bring it in a bit. And for this specific project, I'm going to actually have my tripod lashing a little bit lower because I, I want these sticking out the top. So I'll bring it down, take the end. I'll kind of loop it around a few times. And then I'm going to try to pull it where the line tightens up on those. Almost like a timber hitch, really. It just allows a good start. Sorry about the canine in the background. There's people that are doing bushcraft stuff about half a kilometer over or so. A half mile, whatever that is, not even. So... Either way. So once I know that that's kind of set on fairly solid, I'm going to go around it once or twice. Ideally, you're going to want to go at least twice if you can. I'm going to stand back a bit. See if I can get this in the shot better. Oh, I can see the camera's off. I'll cut scenes, I'll come back. Okay, so hopefully this camera angle's a bit better. So, I'm going to kind of bring that all up. Open out the way, the legs, the way they're going to want to go. Can I get my tripod shape? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of want to weave them instead of just going around. I just want to weave this cordage kind of all over. Hook it on in all sorts of different ways. Try to tie it off and go through as many different points as you can that are different. And that really just will solidify the tripod so that it's not going anywhere. I'll do a close up on what I'm doing here. Like I say, there's nothing fancy, it's not fancy knots or anything. And then when I get to the end, I want to do almost like a clove hitch. And now I'm to the thin end of the root where it can really bind on fairly securely. I'll just leave it at that for now and switch my angles and kind of show you what I've done. So you can see here, the root is just wrapped around every different way it can, if you will. Anywhere you find a different way to go, do so. And at the end, I cleaned off a bit of it. And as you can see, it can lash down fairly tightly to one of the main legs, if you will. So I'll just lash that a bit tighter. And then that'll be this tripod. And like I say, just as, just as functional as the ones I normally make with the paracord loops and that kind of stuff. Just done purely with resources off the land. Okay, so I just tighten off the lashing. Nothing fancy. Just very primitive. Hook it onto the tree stumps or to the tree branches, if you will. But you can see... It's adjustable in height and stuff. I can move the legs. Not quite as flexible as paracord, obviously. But you get 90% of the functionality and you didn't have any external gear you had to bring in. Other than just your saw to cut the wood. So I'll use this now. There was a reason why I made this lower. Normally I would do these knots up higher uh, for hanging on the fire and stuff. But for this specific example of what I'm doing, I actually want things to be a fair bit lower. So I want them to be more close to, you know, chest, stomach height, that kind of thing, right? So, and I'll show you why now. I brought in that plastic container that I have, and that plastic container I plan on using as a water basin, so I'll find a way that it sits you know, fairly securely here, so I know that I could fill it with water and it's not going anywhere. Kind of adjust the angles of things to make sure that container when full, I can wash my hands and use it without risk of it just slipping off the edge. So, so I'll tweak that a little bit and kind of get it in an ideal position. I'll go down to the uh, river or creek that's just around the bend over here. Now I'll go down and I'll fill this up with water. And it just have it's clean water. I'm not worried about things, but uh, just to kind of get the rest of this example moving. 
All right, so here's my water supply. That's pretty good. The water up in the area, I mean, is pretty unpolluted. Either way, I'll just grab a bucket of water so I've got something to wash my hands and back at camp. Oh. Yeah, normally this creek is big enough to go right across where all the stone is. So, I'll show you how dry it is out here right now. Okay, so I've moved the uh, tripod and the water basin and that kind of thing over off to the side so it's not in the area that I cleared out. This is going to be mainly for my shelter to go here. But uh, I'll just come in on it now. You can see just a bucket of water and a place to hang a rag, if you will. So it allows me to have, it's really, really warm out here. So it just allows me to have a kind of a cool down water station. If I was really worried, I boil any water before I drink it. But when it comes to cooling me down, you know, put it in my hair, put it in my smog, that kind of thing. You know, it's, uh, it, it's safe enough in all those ways. So I'm okay with that. But either way, there you have it. A, you know, bushcraft tripod made out of purely primitive stuff. super warm I don't really want to take off my jacket too much because the mosquitoes are enough to eat you alive at this time of year so you know just kind of keep myself moist but I still need to keep myself covered <laughs> but yeah this is a great way to have kind of a little sink basin kitchen you know cleaning area and water area water station if you will and fairly elementary to do so I'll just let that hang to dry but there you have it, water station. Oh, man. It is warm today though. Let's see. Man, it says it's only 18, but it feels warmer than that today. It's real dryness in the air. So I gotta put together a tripod for the camera too here and get it up to get better angles. So I'm just gonna use one of my loops of rope that I've done in many different past videos to do that. So I just gotta find some sticks and I'll just whip that together. So here's the three sticks now I'll need for my tripod for the uh, camera. I didn't bother filming me cleaning off the little branches off them and stuff. That's not that exciting and everybody knows how to do that. Pretty basic. But either way, I'll lash this together now. Okay, so for people that have watched previous videos of mine, and I see this in almost every video, take a loop of rope that was cut to 28 inch length, where I tied some fisherman's knots into it to tie the rope together. I double that loop up on itself. I take the three sticks I have. I want to set that loop over all three of them. Make sure it's down in a couple inches. And I want to take the middle stick and just start to turn it on itself and roll that. I'll step back so I can get it in the camera good. And just keep rolling that middle twig or branch. Just keep spinning it and spinning it until you feel it starts to become tight to the others. As soon as you know that it's on there fairly tight, you don't want it super tight so it can't move, but tight enough where you know it's not going anywhere. There's your tripod. So this is made out of really small diameter sticks. They were good length but small diameter because it doesn't need to hold weight. It's just got to carry the camera. <coughs> so I'll just take my tarp off now. Start to get ready to set up my shelter. Let's see where this walking stick will come in useful. I'm going to dig my temp eggs out of the bag, so I'll cut back. Okay, so I've got my 10 by 10 AquaQuest Defender King Camo tarp, 3 meter by 3 meter. It tends to be my preferred tarp to use just because of the weight of it. I think it weighs in at just under two pounds. So it just makes it really easy to carry and use. 
I do like using my 10 by 13 as well, but it weighs uh, closer to five pounds, so a fair bit heavy. But I can do a lot of things with this one, so I'm okay with that. So I just want to set this out on the level pad and get it where everything's laying as flat as it can so I know where things are going to go kind of thing. Now this pad is fairly level all through here and starts to slope off on that side. So as I set this up I'll try to keep that in mind. So the thinking really is fairly simple. Yeah. A couple ten pegs, I could easily use some sticks and just fashion ten pegs in this environment. <coughs> but I had these with me, so say the Just gonna peg off the outside corner ends. Gonna have to bang that one in. What a big deal. Do the same on the other side. I want to come right out with it as far a reach as I can. Now the two front ends. I don't know if the camera's going to catch this. Okay, so I'm going to switch angles. So the two front end ones. On the outside, I'm going to pull them in together. And I want them to be taut to both back corners. They're in fairly taut. Now I'm going to take that walking stick I have. This is uh, an adjustable walking stick that can go up to, it can go fairly high. It's really uh, actually a rifle um, aiming aid where you got kind of a hunting stick that you can use to put the, the rifle on the top of. I don't know exactly what the length is I'm going to need this at. So I'll just kind of keep it a little bit flexible at this point in time. But what I'm going to do is go into the inside now. And I'm going to want to lift that up from the inside to make it more of a pyramid shape. So I'll just slide into it now. So that's going to be the rough height of it. I haven't set it to be super tight. I want to just grab one of my rags out of my bag and use that on the top of the stick just to make sure it doesn't pierce through the tarp. So I'll grab my rag and set it on the supports, support on the inside and to protect the tarp and tighten everything up and then I'll cut back. Okay, so you can see the pyramid shelters up now. It really doesn't take any length of time. I uh, normally would use my shemog on the top of the walking stick there to protect the tarp um, but because I use the shemog in the water basin, you know, kitchen area example uh, just leaving that there and letting it be what it is so I'm using my green water filter that I normally use for my can for gathering river water and stuff but I know that uh, there's no dirt that's going to risk coming in contact with that so I feel comfortable in doing so but uh, there you have it, this is the pyramid shelter it'll be the main shelter that I'm kind of using tonight and uh, I'll just switch camera angles and do a pan around and you can see that uh, it's 10 foot long on each side and then I'll show you the inside so as you can see it's a very simple shelter just a three-sided pyramid with each side being 10 foot in length so it's not necessarily my favorite shelter I do like it for the weather resistance 
I like it for the speed in which you can set it up. As you can see, it only took a matter of seconds, really. And then if I was hustling and it was rain and everything else, I'd have this up in probably under two minutes. But, you know, uh, I don't, the one thing I don't like is the pyramid shape itself. You end up losing a lot of internal space for your shelter. So it ends up being a little bit more compact. It is 10 foot on each side and stuff with the pole in the middle. So you could sleep two, three people into it, but it gets packed, right? It's, I, I like having lots of room to be able to move around. So I'll just go inside it now. So as you can see, you just kind of step into it. I'll just get fully in there. So that's where I'll end up setting up my sleeping area. You know, that side to that side or this side out. No, it doesn't, uh, the camera is not giving it any justice, isn't it? As you can see, I just use the water filter rag to, you know, help protect the tarp from any damage. Now I can shift this pole subtly and just kind of move it out of the way if I want a bit, uh, a bit extra kind of room to one side or the other. There is a bit of give that way. But uh, that's the only thing I find is it does create definitely enough space in here to easily shelter and get out of the bad weather and blah 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 but it seems a little bit confining you know there's there's room to move around and stuff a bit and you could put a bag and your stuff in here i don't know i just uh other configurations i've done are way more open and spacious and you know uh the, there's one that i make that's uh, almost like igloo shape and uh i actually prefer that one even though the opening is bigger it just gives a lot more real estate on the inside but this one is great for uh you know setting up fast you know fast and simple setups are always good for if if conditions change rapidly and you need to uh change with them this is uh this is a fast way to go about things so i'll just slide back out again and you can see getting in and out isn't that complex at all if those were wet you know you get a bit of moisture on you but there's the pyramidal tarp shelter so i'll get ready to move on to the next part of the project here so i think i may have a little bit of a change of heart when it comes to things uh, this only took three tent pegs to set up the shelter with the walking stick but uh given how the mosquitoes are everywhere i just watched a few flying in underneath i might even see if i can pin this down just to help kind of close off the sides i'll do that on all three sides just to help close off the sides and kind of cut down on some of the some of the bug activity that's going on out here. It's just really bad. So I'm gonna do that on each of the three sides, try to close things up a bit, and uh, I'll cut back. I won't bother showing that because all I'm doing is sticking a couple of 10 pegs in at the midway points along the lines. Put the side 10 pegs in. Didn't even push them in all the way. They're really just there to help kind of keep it closer to the ground a little bit, which they're doing at this point in time. And just really minimize the amount of bugs getting into that shelter as much as possible. Mosquitoes out here are just everywhere. The river levels are way lower than normal for um, the season. And even though there's not a fire ban on right now, the mosquitoes are building up in the stagnant pools down by the river really in abundance. I've seen extra frogs and extra mosquitoes. It's just the nature of having kind of lower water levels. But uh, so this shelter hopefully will help keep a better part of the bugs out. Keep my fingers crossed on that one. All right, well, this is an exciting find. This is uh, Chicken of the Woods. It's one of the first uh, showings of it I've seen this year. It's all up this dead tree that I'm at. So I'm not gonna eat any with my meal tonight because I've already got enough food to just do, but I'm gonna harvest this stuff, take it home and dry it out and use it probably in future videos. This uh, mushroom is one of the best, if not the best in my perspective, of uh, flavors. It tastes just like chicken. It's fantastic. So to harvest this, I want this to be able to grow back in future years. So I'm just going to take my knife, just my little pocket knife I got with me. It's got the finer blade on it. And I want to just, I'll see if I can do this without getting in the way of the camera. I want to get in close where I'm not quite to the tree. And I slowly want to just kind of saw away at that until it comes off cleanly. So I'm going to do that to these mushrooms as they go and throw them into a bag and get them ready to bring back home with me. As you can see, in a matter of minutes, I managed to harvest off quite a few of these. You know, like I say, I was delicate taking them off the tree. I didn't take everything. I left some of it growing there. But uh, if you were in a survival situation, 
this could be an ample sized meal gathering a few of the other edible plants in the area you could easily uh, get by on this for you know a day or two until you found more things to eat but uh, yeah this is chicken of the woods okay so I'm gonna put up my rapid bridge line now that I've shown in detail in the previous video and I'm just gonna hook that on to this tree here and I'm gonna run across to the tree over there I want that to be fairly high. This is really just going to be to stop any debris coming off the trees above me. So I want it to be above head height. When it comes to the other end, there's a fair bit of slack still. This line's amply long enough to go between these two trees. So. I'm going to loosen up my closet. I slide it along. Gather up some of the slack on the line. I want this side to be above head height as well. up now. I'm going to get my two projects on the line to hook my tarp onto. That should be good enough height I think. It's well above my head height. Okay, I'm just going to grab my uh, trusty poncho tarp. Pull that out of the bag. I swear more stuff gets jumbled up as soon as you press record on the <laughs> video than any, right? any other time. So, got my poncho, which is a tarp. I'm going to string that up on the ridge line. So I'm just going to take my ends, feed that through the prosec, set a stick on it. Let that kind of be set now. Take the other end. Do the same thing on this side. This one's a bit tighter, so I'm going to put the prosthetic through the tie off instead. It's tight because I've got the guy lines on already existing, which I tend to just leave on there. One thing I wish that they had made larger tie-off loops on this poncho tarp. They make them fairly small, which is not really ideal in my perspective, but it is what it is. So in fact, I'll slide that right, a bit. So that's the thinking, really. Now I'm going to come off and tie off onto some trees. So, but I can see that here. I'll run out my guy line for this side. 
I know that I'm going to be shy of being able to reach that tree. I'm a fair bit shy. So I'm going to have to use another line coming off that tree to hook on to my guy out point or guy out line and I'll, I'll do a close in on that too. So if you've watched previous videos of mine, you know I always like to carry these small hanks of rope where I've put a tied a like a bowline knot in it. It's not a bowline knot that I use, but uh, you know that kind of style where there's just a loop on the end and it's all just quick released. It's a six, eight foot length of rope. So the thinking really is I'm going to take this loop, hook it around the tree just like I did for the backpack and feed the tag end through and that way I've got a way to cinch onto the tree. So I'll do that now. It's nothing complex really. I want to come up fairly high because I want this tarp to be like I say above head height. And you can see the trees in the location I'm in are just large diameter. I might actually need to use two loops and I'm highly suspect that I will to even get around this tree. I'm lucky I managed to get away with one. But now you can see the length isn't very long. So one way or the other, I'm going to have to hook on a second one regardless. But I'll do that now. So the first order of business, I'm going to need to put a marlin spike hitch onto this line. Set the loop. Come up, come through. Put my piece of wood in. Tighten it on there. So I've got a toggle point to do an extension. Take that same style line that I have previously. I think this one has loops on both ends. But it's the same six, eight foot length of rope where I either have one or two uh, line ties or loops, sorry, and I'm hooked onto it. So all I'm gonna do is feed the loop. I'm gonna feed it through itself. And then I'm gonna hook onto that toggle and make sure I'm on the line, not the toggle. Set that tight. Now I've got a line extension I can go off further with. Okay, so I could easily turn around and hook another Marlin spike hitch on here, which I'm going to do. It gives me another toggle point that I've come out off. Now I'm a further distance. I'll just set that down for a second and grab the line for the tarp itself. Now I've got prusik loops that are on my guy lines so I can make it adjustable. All I really need to do is to take that Marlin spike hitched toggle that I just hooked on, feed it through my prusik line, and then pull any slack on the prusik. And it's set. And if you've got loops on the end, you could feed a stick through the loop and do the same kind of thing on the prusik loop. You just hook one loop onto another, but it achieves the same result. And as you can see, easily adjustable for releasing tension, that kind of thing, setting it to exactly how we want it. I like to have my tarps fairly tight. So, and the only thing is you've got this line coming off. So depending on where you put this toggle here and how much slack you have, I can move this toggle closer to the tree so the line's probably out of the way more, um, which I'm probably going to end up doing. But I just wanted to show the example in detail of how to easily extend the line out without having to really tie a lot of knots and do anything and still have it be all adjustable. So like I say, if I wanted to adjust these what I call drip lines, because if it's raining the water will drip down these lines to move them further away from where I'm going to be in my camp, I just loosen that prusik off. I turn around and take that Marlin spike hitch toggle that I put on. Oh. Just free that off. Now all I'm going to do is open up that Marlin spike hitch all together and release its knot. I'm going to move a little further up that line and set the Marlin spike hitch a little further over. I release the tension on my prusik so that I've got any of the slack line from the guy lines from my tarp that are kind of free from all of that. Just slide the Prusik loop back over the toggle again and you can see my drip line is now far closer to the tree and out of the way from where you would walk and then I just apply tension to my Prusik 
to set the tension of the tarp. And now these drip lines have moved further away from my tent and camp and that kind of thing and closer to the tree where I'm not going to find that these get annoying and in my face or anything. But you can see easily adjustable. And that's as much tension as I can even give it. So that tarp will be up there good and taut. So like I say, I'm going to do the exact same thing on this tree. <coughs> but I'm not going to use quite the same amount of toggles that I did. On my lengths of, you know, six, eight foot lengths, I've got one that's an eye tied on both ends or a loop tied on both ends. So knowing that this tree has a larger diameter and that potentially there's not going to be a lot of slack coming off it when I go around it, I'm just going to preemptively tie two of my hanks of, you know, my mini hanks, if you will. I'm going to tie two of these together. So I'll just free them both up from their, you know, windings. I'm going to take the loop off, the one that just has a tail on the one end and a loop on the other. I'm going to just feed it through. I'm going to take the tag end or tail end of it, feed it back through itself, just to hitch those two lines to each other. So I know that I've got ample length now to go around this tree. So because of the sheer size of it, I'll just hook that there and walk it around. You know, in a lot of places the tree diameters don't get nearly this large so you don't have these types of problems nearly as much but when you're in the Pacific Northwest of North America trees get big things happen so you can see I'm now tied off to that tree and ready to go off to my guy line where I just need to put a marlin spike hitch onto this position as well so normally I would just use a longer piece of rope, but I just wanted to show this example. I'm still not long enough, even hooking two of these together. So just take a third and daisy chain them. You know, I don't recommend doing this. I recommend, you know, just using a proper length rope. But uh, this is more just to show the functioning example of how this works. And like I said, so the loop, I just feed the end through itself to create almost like a noose. Hook that on to the toggle that was marlin spike hitched onto the line. Make sure that there's no slack in there. It's all nice and tight, the knots to themselves. And now I've got enough line to go off. There's even ways I could show, and I'll probably do it in another video, where you can use loops themselves to just kind of add an extra half foot or a foot if you're only shy by a little bit. But like I said, it's always better to just use the proper lengths. But uh, I just, uh, I, I try to emphasize the use of these Prusik loops with the toggles because they're one of the mainstays of bushcrafting in my perspective when you're out in the field and wanting to do things that are easily adjustable and rapid. So I'm just going to, like I say, finish tying off the uh, poncho tarp and get that all you know, taut and set up. But uh, I just kind of wanted to stop and walk through that to show kind of the importance of using these knots. So, and it's just one last example of that mindset. I'll take my guy line with the Prusik loop on it, and my tie off to the tree with its toggle. Just hook the Prusik loop onto the rope itself, and then just apply the tension on the Prusik. Allows me to easily have a nice taut line. You can see I could have potentially multiple toggles that sit along this line. But normally I would recommend just using a length of line that was more appropriate. But sometimes when you're in the woods and you've only got certain resources, you have to improv, right? This just is another skill to add to the toolbox. So as you can see, this tarp is nice and high. I'm six foot tall, it's well above my height. And it was easy to set up even at that height. You know, sometimes it's difficult using conventional knots to try to do things when you're fully reaching and everything else. When you're using the prussels and the toggles and those types of things, it makes doing things, even if it's, you know, a foot or two above your head, it still makes things easy to do and easy to set all taut and, and firm the way you want it to be. But uh, the base camp is starting to come together, as you can see. I've got to still get my fire pit together. I actually want to take my little triangle table that I have and set that out at some point uh, somewhere in this area to kind of add to my kitchen zone, but uh, I'll probably do that next. 
there's a little stump in my camp and it's right in a prime location because my fire is either going to go there or my fire is going to go there when I get to that point. So I'll probably put my stool somewhere around here and I'm going to try to just take this and level it off so i got a place I can set down my water bottle. A little micro sized table if you will. Nothing too fancy but gives me a little stump I can put my stuff on. Alright, get my stool out at this point. No, I haven't bothered putting on my knee pads today. This ground is fairly soft and it's fairly deep for the dirt for the soil. So, and everything's bone dry out here. It hasn't rained much at all. So, not really too worried about knee pads, but I know I should have them on just for, you know, goodness sake. But let's see if that stumps like it was meant to be. So this is my walk stool. It's a Comfort 55 if people want to know what stool I use. I used to buy the little cheapy $10 ones over the years and went through a pile of them. You now they last a couple months and then they end up breaking. So I decided to invest the money in a good quality tripod stool and I haven't regretted it. It stays strapped in my bag and I use it every single time I go out. You know, if I forget it I feel like I'm uh, deprived if you will and have to improv things out here. But uh, this is probably one of the best tools I've ever used in my life. I've had it for months and months now and it's as new as it was when I bought it for when it comes to any wear and tear on it. So having this little wash basin may seem like a, you know, not really a critical thing and it's not. But when it comes to really warm weather like it is today, you know, it's uh, like I say, not wanting to take my jacket off because of the bugs. It allows it that I can easily keep cooling myself down, you know get cold wet water on my head let my body temperature drop a little bit while I'm doing things and whatever I do even though it's hot and I don't want to take my jacket off I don't really want to break into full sweats you know my clothes will turn all wet and then later on when the sun goes down and the temperature drops I'll be cold so I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible but like I say in these warm warm weather conditions having a wash basin like this is just fantastic it really adds to your comfort as you're doing things I could wet my schmog and you know, wrap it around my neck and that type of stuff and really, if it was even hotter than it is, and really help drive my core temperature down by keeping my jugular veins nice and cool and damp. But uh, it's not quite that hot. It's just hot enough where I don't want to be doing too much before I really start breaking a heavy sweat and have to unzip and let the bugs eat me alive and cool down. So by having this basin, it really helps stop me having to do that. Okay, so I'm just going to get out my trusty triangle table that I made a couple months ago. I actually find it's been quite handy. So I've got my kitchen basin set up here. I've got a triangle piece of fabric where it's got three guy lines that are tied onto it. And uh, I'm just going to set those all out. Now the thinking really is because I want to be adjustable in the position of where this table is floating. I'm going to make all the, um, all the tie-offs to the trees. I'm going to go to this tree, the tree right here, and the tree back there. But in order to position where the table's floating, I'm going to make all my knots that I'm doing adjustable. I'm going to use a modified uh, Fairmont hitch, which I've shown in previous videos. But I'm going to use that to make it that I can apply tension to any one of the three points and make those adjustable. I'll do a close-up of that knot. I'm going to take one of the guy lines that I've got coming off my triangle table. <coughs> I'm going to come around this tree. All I've done is kind of sling it around the tree. I'm going to make a loop in the line where it kind of sits underneath itself. Then I'm going to take that loop, wrap it around three times. Potentially four. Yeah, I'll just do three. And I'm going to take a bite of the tag end of the line, the tail end of the line, and I'm just going to feed that through. And I'm going to kind of tighten everything up. This knot's a bit finicky when you first get it set. So you kind of have it set and be nice. But once it's on there, it becomes a very effective knot. And it uh, acts like a it acts like a prusik in a lot of ways. Or I can uh, shift and adjust it on there, apply tension it, it won't give and shift it back and it'll hold. 
so that it gives me a level of adjustability. I'll do that to each one of the trees that I connect to and that way I can shift and adjust where the table's floating in the air. Okay, so I was planning on tying off to this tree here, but because it's too off-centered from the triangle, it's just too much of an angle. I'm going to try to sink this uh, spike that I made out of a branch into this old dead, old growth stump. I just need a point to tie off to. So I'll try to set that in as firm as I can to ensure that I've got a good clean point to tie out to. We'll see how I do. The only place I could sink into this old growth tree trunk was on this side and the back side, if you will. So I had to attach uh, an extension line and it's got a prusik on it. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing like I did with the tarp. Now I've got my prusik line sitting here. I'm gonna do the exact same thing I did with the tarp. I'm gonna take the line coming off the table. I'm gonna put a marlin spike hitch on it and use that prusik to loop onto it and just apply tension that way. So you can see now, uh, you know, like I said, I had to kind of improv it on the third one where I used the toggle and the uh, prusik loop. But now all three points, using the modified pheromone hitches on two of these points, you know, here and here, it allows me to make that floating table adjustable to its position. If I turn around and made this one and this one tighter, it would bring and loosen the back one. It would bring the table forward and floating more over top of the water basin. Right now, I've positioned it where the table is just behind the water basin. But with this kind of setup, it allows me, if I wanted to shift it, I could still have tension and shift it to be over top so any debris falling from the trees wouldn't fall into there. But uh, I won't, given the restrictions I have with the back one, I can't adjust my height of where this table is sitting. So this seemed to be the best position to kind of leave things sitting in at this point in time. So either way, the floating table's up. It gives me kind of another step of being up and off the ground. All right, well, my micro kitchen environment is set up now. You know, with a plastic container and a small triangle piece of tarp with a bit of rope, uh, it, it gives me a whole way to get up off the ground. And I've got a raised environment, you know, get out of the dirt and that kind of stuff. Like I say, it's just really warm. So, I'm wanting to just stay cool, but the bugs haven't calmed down. There's not very much of a breeze today, so everything's just kind of still and calm, and the bugs are in full effect. So, but you know, when it comes to ultra light kits, you don't get much lighter than this. I'm just going to clear out a patch where the fire is going to end up going. I want to make sure that you know, any roots and stuff are up and out of the way. And just like, uh, just like I showed earlier, uh, extremely strong. It takes a lot of effort to break these roots. You know, so if you're short of cordage and you need to improv something, the roots are definitely a usable option. They're not quite as strong as paracord or any of that business. But, uh, you know, modern stuff is always good. But uh, they're definitely effective in being able to do a lot of stuff, though. So, you know... I just want to get them up and out of the... Uh, I want to get them up and away from the fire pit so there's no risk of the fire running the lines of the roots, if you will. Of, I take dry sticks off the forest floor and because I just dug up the debris that was on top of the forest floor in this location to make it more fire safe, and, um, the land here is moist. The moisture, you know, a couple inches under the earth is just... It holds on even if it's dry in the air and it'll stay there for longer, way longer. So needless to say, in order to kind of alleviate the moisture problem, I want to take dry sticks that I've pulled off the forest floor around me, which there's tons of, and I want to make a bed of those so when I go to start my fire, it's lifted up off that moisture. Then because they're not, you know, airtight to each other, air can flow in and underneath the fire. Sometimes, if I know the conditions are really damp, I'll even dig a small trench underneath here to ensure that even more oxygen gets in from underneath. 
you know, it's bone dry where I am right now, so I'm not too worried in that regard. And I've got some other tricks I want to show with this fire, so either way, uh, I'll fatten out this bed of sticks a little bit just to make sure that it's got a good base to kind of get the fire up off the dirt. And uh, we'll start to gear up all the fire stuff. Okay, so for doing my cooking setup, I didn't record it because I just had to go out in the field and find it and didn't want to bring the camera with me, but either way. So this was a branch that was growing on a tree. Cut it here. I cut it on a 45 degree angle and then I cut it on the other side. That'll end up going into the ground and just hammered into the earth. And then I also have another stick where I cut a 45 on it just to make it easier to go into the earth. And then on the top of it, there was kind of a Y, which was a little weak, but the sticks around here aren't very strong. The nature of the wood itself, it's very brittle. So to find a good solid piece of wood that hasn't rotted out in dry rainforest country is, this is what I get. So needless to say, I'm gonna hammer this into the earth. I'm gonna hammer that into the earth. And I'm gonna have a stick that goes from underneath the one side up over, and then the weight of the grill and the food hanging over the fire will keep everything kind of set in place. So that's, instead of doing a tripod, that's what I'm gonna do. If I find that uh, this wood is too brittle and these break and I can't replace them with valid wood from the area, I'll probably switch back up to a tripod or potentially a ridge line over the fire. But uh, this is the one I want to do, you know, and fit this into the video. So we'll see how it goes. Wish me luck. Oh, there or so. The main thing I'm worried about is where I've cut this notch in to help. Uh, this is a number seven notch I've set into the wood. Uh, because it's a weak point here, I'm worried that as I hit it with the rock, potentially it's going to break at that point. But I want to try to get this down into the earth a half decent amount. That seems relatively stable. Excellent. Alright. So, and then the thinking, like I say, we're going to have a stick that comes up over and then the other piece of wood is going to be here to kind of lock that in place so that as the weight of the food and that sits on this stick it doesn't uh, flip and go and go right into the fire. This is just a way to kind of ensure that things are locked down a bit. trying to see where a good placement of that's going to be. I want to make sure the end is far enough to be right over the center of the fire. So it should be maybe a little bit more. So the same kind of thing. I'm just going to pound this into place. Okay, so just grab my grill and get that out. So I know I still got to throw my ground sheet and a sleeping bag into the shelter. I don't know if I'll bother adding that into the video. I think the video, I've got my suspicions this video is already starting to get long. My videos tend to kind of run longer than I thought they would. So I'm a little leery about, you know, adding in stuff that really isn't that necessary. But like I say, there's my grill. I'll end up hooking that on and see where it sits. I might have to hook a prusik loop onto that piece of wood, or a lark's head I should say, onto that piece of wood just to make it and, and put a couple notches in that piece of wood and potentially even get a longer stick. And, um, just to make sure I've got some adjustability of where it sits over top of the fire. This is the basic setup. Like I say, it's kind of hitched on to here by the way that the wood hooks. And then comes up there's just a nub on the wood that's kind of holding on to that chain to make sure it doesn't slide towards me but in order to adjust this now I've got the chain wrapped around here where I can I can kind of uh, pull this and raise it up and lower it so it's not quite as flexible in my perspective it's not quite as flexible as uh, 
having the having the tripod because the tripod you can just move and shift and position it pretty well however you want but uh, you know when you're doing bushcraft videos you want to show different things of this is one of the alternative setups you can do to kind of hang things over the fire so you can see there's just a nub in the wood here where the chain kind of sets on I have it wrap around this stick once or twice and then how it all kind of holds taut is and if you've watched previous videos of mine, you know I have these little S hooks that are hooked on. So I just come around the, the kind of lifting piece of wood and just S hook it back onto itself. And that way it kind of locks and allows me to adjust and set and lock that into position. And then it's really just gravity that's holding the rest of this in place. So there's a fallen pine tree, I think it is. So this is what I'm going to harvest my twigs off of and that kind of stuff to get the fire ready to get going. Like I say, really, I'm just going to take these sticks that I just broke off and then bust them down into two categories. Anything that's smaller than the pencil size goes in one pile. Anything that's larger goes in the other. So as you can see, I've got half-decent sized pile of the twigs and then larger sticks here. So I've got to move up to bigger wood now, but. Here's one of the good parts about coming to areas that get used often. Oh, somebody's already cut a stump here. There's multiples. And I saw some more over in that location. And uh, there's some more over in that location too. So I potentially have some wood that I can use that's already been half worked for me. This stuff's probably the wettest, but it was one of the bigger pieces. So I think I'll grab this and use that as my cutting block, if you will, and uh, haul that back to camp and uh, see if I can't grab some easy wood from over there and over there to kind of help build my wood pile. I just wanted to just show you guys something here where, so on this uh, tree here, you see almost like blisters that are forming on the tree. If I take my small twigs and kind of pop those almost like you'd pop a pimple, there's moisture inside them, like a sap, a resiny sap. And that stuff is highly combustible. So I'll just pull out my lighter here and just show you what I'm talking. I can smell it uh, as soon as I, uh, as soon as I even got it on the stick. So normally a twig this size wouldn't take very easily with a flame. But you can see the resins that are in this these blisters on this tree take a flame really easily and they'll hold it for a good 20 30 seconds at least you know so i'm going to use this as my fire starter instead of using fat wood or anything else i'll just use these i'll take a bunch of twigs and um kind of do the exact same thing to the twigs and you can see i can almost get this single piece of wood to stay going just off of having a bit of that sap resin on there. So that's my thinking though, is I'm going to take my uh, small sticks, I'm going to douse a bunch of them in there. I'm not going to bother with ferro rods and that kind of stuff right now. I've done that in lots of previous videos, uh, different ways to make fires. I'm just going to use lighter this time. But uh, I'm going to use the, the blisters that form on this tree here. I'm going to use these on a bunch of small sticks and make sure that they get impregnated or soaked, I should say, with that kind of highly flammable resinous liquid. Let's see if I can get that on the camera. And it'll make getting the fire going real easy. I won't need to make tinder bundles or any of that business. This stuff will be uh, uh, amply good enough to get the tinder going with these. Okay, so I took a small bundle of the twigs and I've popped a pile of the blisters that were on the tree. And I'm just gonna use that as my starter way to make my fire go. So I'm just going to use a lighter to get it lit. But as you can see, it definitely doesn't take any time to get it going. So now I just want to try to get this twig bundle going now. Now the flames are not strong enough to even push through the twig bundle at this point in time. 
So I'm just going to let that sit and let those twigs dry out, warm up, and let the flames come right through them. We're going to see a lot of white smoke come off of this at the beginning, <coughs> as any moisture that's in there is going to come out. But like I say, you can see, using those blisters on that tree, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's highly flammable materials. Uh, I believe the same stuff they use to make turpentine out of. So, you know, uh, you can see the flames are already starting to rise up now through the pile. I kind of loosen the pile up, let the air get into it a bit. Move up to my smaller, large sticks. Let that go for another second. But very easy to get the fire going using that material. To me, it's better than fatwood. It's it's really, it is the best in my perspective. Of the, those resins are just fantastic. They take a, 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 when it comes to a fair rod strike, they won't ignite very easily off of a fair rod strike. I haven't found anyways. But uh, as soon as it becomes flame, uh, that uh, fuel just burns and burns. It doesn't have any issue with it as soon as it uh, moves away from just being a spark, if you will. So I'm just going to let that kind of all sit on there, dry out, build up. You can see, easy way to get the fire going. So it's about three or four minutes into the fire being lit now. Maybe five or six tops. You can see the fire's burning well. The, these pine branches, when you use those, the, the resins from the blisters is on the tree, uh, in combination with these pine, dried out pine branches, they just go. It doesn't burn for a long time, but they'll burn easy and they'll, you know, they'll just go. So I'll be moving up to larger pieces of wood pretty quick here. It's, uh, I just want this to kind of die back a bit and start to form a little bit of a coal base before I start adding on the other ones. Even though the flame's well above, I could start throwing on larger pieces of wood. I, I want to just kind of hold off and let the fire get a little smaller first. I don't want it to go too fierce. I'm fairly close to the tree beside me there, so I don't want it to be this big raging fire. I just want it to be hot enough to cook my dinner. So hey there fellow YouTubers, Frank Bush here again. Thanks for joining me on another one of my bushcraft adventures. As you can see, this time I went with the pyramid shelter, you know, simple setup. Uh, the water basin with the tripod to a different alternative way to hang the grill over the fire. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you do enjoy this type of content, please like, share, and subscribe, and thanks for watching. Cheers. Hey, I just pulled over my cutting board and used it as a kind of table for me. I think we're at the point where I can pretty well pull the steak off. Pretty excited, hungry, haven't really eaten a huge amount today, so let's just see if it turned out cooked enough. And as you can see, medium rare, just the way I like it, perfect. <laughs> 